Welcome to the Fantasy Football Show here on Sporting News. And as is the case every August, there's only one thing to talk about in the fantasy football world, and that is sleepers. Everyone wants to find the next big breakout star. So that's what we're talking about here today. We're going to start with quarterback sleepers. And Vinny, going into this year, perhaps more than any other year, I can remember a lot of focus and a lot of hype on some second-year signal callers. Who do you like? Yeah, this is the post-hype sleeper portion, and these second-year guys really disappointed as rookies, and not for their own faults. So Trey Lance didn't get to start last year for the 49ers, but now he fully has that opportunity under Kyle Shanahan, and I think the floor is tremendously high. He's got a lot of weapons. The offensive line is great. We know he's going to be involved running, and for those who don't think Kyle Shanahan can work in a running quarterback, just look at Robert Griffin III in his big rookie year in 2012. He likes that complete package. Lance has the big arm to do what he wants downfield he's going to play well off the weapons here so there's a lot of points to be had there he's finishing right now in a lot of drafts as a back-end QB1 and I think he could be a lot higher than that this QB12 on the board is a popular spot for him but you look at the system it's great George Kittle Debo Samuel Brandon Ayuk, Elijah Mitchell in the running is going to help Lance in that aspect of his game as well. So I see a high ceiling for him. I love him there. And similarly, in a different system, going a little bit deeper, is Zach Wilson. That 49er system traveled there to the Jets. He's got great receivers now overall. When you look at Elijah Moore, Corey Davis, the rookie, Garrett Wilson, got some tight end help. They've got a running game. They've got an offensive line. And Zach Wilson can do some running himself to put up some numbers. So Lance on the high-end sleeper side, and I like Wilson rebounding as well and uh, staying healthy for a big year too. Yeah, Wilson a little bit in deeper leagues I think could be there. You know, when you look at Wilson though, he just wasn't that good last year and now there was Trevor Lawrence. And when you're betting on those types of guys, you're betting on talent. Can they really break out based on what we know they can do, what we saw them do in college. I think Wilson has a better receiving core, whereas with with Lawrence, you're really banking on addition by subtraction in addition to his superior talent. Lawrence, though, ran a little bit last year. That's kind of what kept him afloat, over 330 rushing yards. So I think that's something that can really help him bounce up, become a consistent every week starter. But based on what we saw last year, there wasn't a lot to hang your hat on because he just wasn't good flat out. I actually think a better sleeper candidate among the sophomore quarterbacks is Justin Fields. Another guy who really wasn't good last year, another guy who people are banking on addition by subtraction with the new coaching staff. But the one thing we know Fields can do is run the ball, 420 rushing yards last year, 10 starts, 12 total games. I think Lance is going to run more. I actually think Lance is sort of a decent bet for a little bit of a long shot quarterback leader in rushing yards. Uh, Could get it, but I think Fields will be right there. Top five, 700 rushing yards is not out of the realm of possibility. And if he does that, he'll be right on that every week uh, starter tier. What do you think of those guys, Vinny, in comparison to the guys you mentioned? Yeah, I think Lance and Fields, we do have to bring that up, is that running element that we know is going to be involved. I mean, I think Lawrence can take off and run, like you said, and put up some numbers that way. Wilson is also a pretty good athlete, and he can get some numbers like that. But I don't think necessarily that's going to be the design of what plays are called for them. So Lance and Fields, a little bit more upside there. I think if you can't get Lance and you don't want to invest too high of a pick and you know a lot of drafters in your league are going to go after him early, Fields is the alternative there. And I think you look at Lawrence and Wilson, if they're pretty close, lean toward the value pick there later in Wilson. So I think all four of those guys are going to be much improved from what we saw last season. The one guy who would avoid around all those guys is Mac Jones. There's just not a lot of upside there with the limited de- Patriots passing game. So avoid Mac Jones, but maybe invest in one of these guys somewhere in your draft, either high or low. Well, I was going to say that the Bears passing game ain't much better, but at least Fields can run. And poor Davis Mills barely got a mention in this conversation. Let's look at some of the veterans, though. Everyone's excited about young guys seemingly have unlimited ceilings. These veterans, they're boring. Oh, we know what they can do. But do we? Sometimes they can do way more than we think. And Derek Carr is a good example. Last year, threw for over 4,800 yards. This year, you add in Devontae Adams. You add in a hopefully healthier Darren Waller, a new coaching staff. Derek Carr, who's right now, that ADP for quarterbacks is right around 12, 13 fringe starter. Can he be a top seven, top five guy, Vinny? Well, you look at the weaponry and also adding Josh McDaniels. That's another reason we don't like Mac Jones. Josh McDaniels is now in Las Vegas working with Derek Carr. So McDaniels is going to open it up and he's going to trust his best players. And 
he's going to do wonders for Hunter Renfro and he's going to make the most out of Darren Waller. There's some loose comparisons that can be made to Rob Gronkowski and Julian Edelman there, but you never ha- quite had a Devontae Adams in his time in New England, uh, maybe a short time with Randy Moss, but that was a long time ago. Devontae Adams is that alpha is going to command the ball. He's got great established chemistry with Carr. So three really top flight weapons there for Carr. It's hard not to produce with those guys, and I think they're going to open up the offense a little bit more. And you play in the AFC West where Justin Herbert two times a season, Patrick Mahomes, and you also now have to deal with Russell Wilson. These are games where the Raiders are going to have to put the ball in the air and score a lot of points to win games. So that's another thing you factor in with Derek Carr, and he's been undervalued for quite some time, reality and and fantasy wise, he's just catching up to that. Well, you know, it, it, he's very similar to Matthew Stafford, to Tom Brady, to Aaron Rodgers. He's going after all of them in drafts. If you ask me, I'll take the value, wait a few rounds, and get Derek Carr and hope he truly does have that breakout. And if you look at some other veterans, another guy who's had a big fantasy season in the past, he's had some bad seasons in the past. People going into this year don't know what to do with them because of a new coaching staff, because of an influx of new, I'll put that in air quotes, wide receivers. That's Jameis Winston. No one knows how to evaluate what's going on in New Orleans. No one knows how to evaluate him. Is he a sleeper, Vinny? I think he is, based on what he did last year when he was healthy, on pace for 34 touchdowns. The yardage was not good, which sounds weird with Jameis Winston, but single-digit interceptions, 30-plus touchdowns. He's got a better receiving core this year. Do you think he's a sleeper, though? Yeah, I think he definitely has some intriguing value here, especially if Alvin Kamara gets a significant suspension early in the season and might force the Saints to put the ball in the air a little bit more than they would like to. And the Saints defense is pretty good, and they're going to try to win with that as much as possible. But again, you got to worry about some high scoring games. You got to put the ball in the air to win in this league. And they wouldn't have got Chris Olave and be more dedicated to a downfield passing game this year if that wasn't the case. So they want to play to Winston's strengths a little bit more within the system, and they, they feel comfortable with him in the system. You have Olave, you got Jarvis Landry, you got Michael Thomas. Basically, he wasn't Maybe. there last year. So, <laughs> Marquez Callaway, his favorite target is now number That's four. Right. So, and, and you go on and on here at Adam Troutman, you might get a little bit more out of him at tight end. So, I, I, I think there are a lot of ways for Winston to put up numbers in this offense. I, I think they wouldn't have trusted him to be the guy not – to deal with any more of this Taysom Hill garbage uh, working him in. I'm sure he'll still get in there a few plays, but not the way that Winston can worry about him. So I really like uh, Jameis Winston here to put up decent numbers and going at his ADP well into the QB twos. That, that's a really good value pick at this point. Yeah, he's good value as a backup quarterback if you're the type that takes backups. One last guy we got to talk about is Tua Tagovailoa some people hate him some people think this is the breakout he's got Tyree Kill he's got Jalen Waddle he's got Mike Gusecki what can he do this just comes down to personal preference I think how how you feel about him it's kind of similar to Trevor Lawrence in a way where you go well this guy was elite in college he hasn't been that great in the pros Tua's got better weapons than Lawrence has can he put it together he's got a new coach now too that should be offensive minded I like him I think he's being under underrated I, I don't want to go into the season with him as my starter but I'm perfectly fine with him as my backup and I think he has a chance to really break out yeah I struggle with this one a little bit Matt only because I love the system I love the situation I mean it's the same system that I just praised Trey Lance and Zach Wilson for being in as boring barring from Kyle Shanahan with Mike McDaniel he's going to take advantage of Tua's athletic skill set use his arm in the right way and we know uh, there's parallels to be made there with Tyreek Hill and the jail Waddle and Mike Isecki with what you can do with the trio of Debo Samuel, Brandon Ayuk, and George Kill in San Francisco. So everything lines up well for what Tua can produce here. It just comes down, do I trust Tua? Do I trust Wilson? Do I trust these guys individually with their immense talent to put it all together here? So that's the only reason for pause on Tua, but everything is there. And sometimes you have to look at the system and the situation and give that as much weight with a young quarterback as much as you do with the talent. Yeah, I agree. Well, that was a look at our quarterback sleepers. Now let's look at running back sleepers. Everyone knows that's the most important one. Fantasy owners love talking about running backs, especially rookie running backs, second year running backs. We're going to start with the second year guys, though, before we get to the rookies. And Vinny, I know one guy you're really high on this year is in Chicago, Khalil Herbert. Why do you think he's a breakout candidate this year? 
Well, I think you look at David Montgomery and you've enjoyed getting some fantasy football points from him, but you're not thrilled. I don't know. I, I don't know if people enjoyed it. They sort of tolerated <laughs> you, it. You just grind through and you expect yeah. you know, RB2 value, but you're not excited about playing David Montgomery. I don't think the Bears are excited about playing David Montgomery. And now you look at their uh, situation with their new zone blocking running scheme. They need some more explosiveness out of the backfield. It's a struggle to watch David Montgomery try to get to four yards per carry, where Khalil Herbert, he came in there and shot himself out of a cannon. We all thought, okay, Damian Williams is going to look great. And that worked for some degree when David Montgomery was not available. But Khalil Herbert said, where did this guy come from? He just looks like a put-together runner with some juice, can reel off the long runs here. I think he's capable of also being versatile enough to catch passes here. So it's a new coaching staff. Everything changes. And I see this as maybe developing into a light version of Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon, where the Dillon part of this equation, Khalil Herbert, might be more appealing as we go forward. So I do like Khalil Herbert, not just as a plus handcuff, but someone who could stand alone here by midseason. Yeah, Dylan, Tony Pollard, Khalil Herbert, these types of handcuffs that could break out and actually finish higher than the guys on the depth chart currently in front of them. A couple more second-year backs we've talked about off-camera is Ramondre Stevenson and Kenneth Gainwell. Gainwell was a guy high on everyone's list going into last year and I think really disappointed. That running back situation remains murky in Philadelphia, and we know Jalen Hurts is going to take a lot of carries himself. In addition to the guys they added in the receiving game, it's tough for me to get excited about Gainwell. Talk me into it Vinny well I I think part of this is not trusting in Miles Sanders and well that's easy to do that part's easy I'm done yeah he's given every opportunity somehow he didn't score a touchdown last year (laughs) I don't know what was going on that uh, way but uh, Jordan Howard they seem to love Jordan Howard and try to get him too much work here but he's not there right now and uh, look at Kenny Gainwell He's very versatile. He can do everything on the field. And every time he was out there, he did something special. But then something happened where the coaching staff cooled on him. I just don't think Jalen Hurts is going to be that effective running in the red zone or overall. So they're going to have to lean on other guys to do that. So I do like the receiving ability of Gainwell. I think they need that element. I don't think Miles Sanders gives them that as much in Philadelphia. So, yeah, he's a sleeper. Again, I I think he would be the guy in line if Sanders continues to disappoint here. So that's why I like him. I like that he can do a little bit of everything when he's out there. Yeah, bottom line, probably a little underrated, even though that situation's confusing because Boston Scott's supposed to be a good receiver and he just doesn't really catch passes consistently. Same with Sanders, same with Gainwell. I don't know what to expect. Personally, I'm staying out of that Philadelphia backfield, but someone probably will break out, which is why Gainwell is a good risk-reward pick. With Stevenson, this is another back backfield I don't want anything to do with ever I see Patriots backfield I turn around I run there's got to be someone else I can draft at every point in the draft where a Patriots guy is at the top of my queue but Ramondre Stevenson has has all sorts of skills he's the most complete back I think in that backfield Damian Harris scored all the touchdowns last year but just tough to count on him catching the ball James White still banged up I really like the rookie out of South Dakota State Pierre Strong but that, then again, I'm one of the eight people in the world who pays attention to FCS football. So maybe my opinion, uh, you know, is a little biased. But I just don't know what to do with that Patriots backfield. Ramondre Stevenson, again, talk me into him, Vinny. Yeah, you look for the best value pick in relation to what he could bring you. And Damian Harris, we know, has durability issues. And there's even rumors that he might be traded at some point this preseason. So be ready for that, uh, giving you a little bit more juice or motivation to go after Stevenson here. He did everything at Oklahoma. He is that complete back. And James White, he's lost Tom Brady. He's lost Josh McDaniels. These are the guys that like to use him the most and I think he is fading he's getting up there well he's hurt I mean we don't know when he's going to be back yeah so I mean he's fading even if he gets back out there on the field at some point what can he do so Stevenson proved capable in that capacity to catch those passes he can also be a straight up power back and finish in the red zone we've seen that so I think the Patriots are a pretty smart organization even though they like this committee approach and they want to be cute and try to make it work with everyone and they'll probably give PR strong a chance at some point this season Stevenson, sometimes you just have to say the talent pops. Patriots are run first team still to set up Mac Jones. 
I want a piece of that backfield if I can get it, but I want the most reasonable piece, and I think Stevenson represents that. Yeah, best price, and it's certainly if you're in a PPR league, I think more overall upside than Harris, but you're always going to be worried about Harris always being the goal line hammer, which is why it's tough, but Stevenson probably still a little bit undervalued. Now let's talk about rookies. That's what people want to talk about when it comes to running backs. Everyone knows the, the high-round rookies, so to speak, with Brees Hall, Kenneth Walker, some of these types of guys, James Cook's another one. Real quick, Vinny, out of those three guys I mentioned that are sort of the more, for lack of a better word, we'll say established rookies, which one's going to most outpace his ADP? I think it's going to be Ken Walker for sure. I mean, are we really trusting Rashad Penny? I'm not. To run with this feature job. Chris Carson's out of the way, so Rashad Penny is the epitome of durability. We're going to trust him based on a short sprint to fantasy football championships last season. No, uh, Ken Walker was drafted pretty high for a reason. They like his skill set. This is the Seahawks going old school. They're saying, okay, we don't have Russell Wilson. We're going to go back to this grindy running game. We need our own version of beast mode. Find a player that most fits that. And Walker was great in college. I do watch a lot of Big Ten. Uh, no offense to the smaller conferences, Matt, but Ken Walker was all over the place running for big things in big games last year. And the talent is there, and he's the type of back that the Seahawks love to run, run, run over and over again. So I don't see Rashad Penny holding up at all, and he's just a better value. you got to pay pretty high to get Brees Hall. And I think James Cook is having a lot of buzz being Dalvin's brother. I think it's part of it. Yeah, that's a big part of it. And also, Devin Singletary is getting all the run with the first team early, and he was really good down the stretch last year. So Cook's a little bit of a wild card. I agree. Walker's the most undervalued. Now let's go to the to the rookie backs who are a little lower. Uh, there's a couple that really stand out. I think Damian Pierce, Tyler Algier, and Rashad White. And these are guys... The first two I mentioned might not even need an injury to be their team's lead back. Certainly with White, you know, four nets in the way. Uh, but you could see him kind of taking over at some point or at least getting enough playing time that he can have standalone flex value. Of those three guys, Vinny, who stands out to you as the most undervalued or the one, if you only could pick one, you definitely want to target. But if you want to really target more than one, say your piece. Well, I try to avoid bad teams in general. It seems like a good <laughs> policy and teams that are not going to score a lot of points and do a lot of good things offensively and don't know what they're doing. And I think Fair. Houston and Atlanta fall in that category. And I look at the Buccaneers, that team is going to be a scoring machine. I know they're a pass first team and they're going to throw it everywhere with Tom Brady with all his new weapons and maybe his last season here. But there's a reason he was elevated to the number two really quickly with the uh, Ronald Jones gone behind Leonard Fournette. They like his skill set Fournette is a guy that uh, I think has probably stayed healthier for a longer time than we expected here of late so it's going to catch up to him I mean just going to with his history of injuries and of course we saw his uh, conditioning issues that were rising here going into camp here so Rashad White I liked him at Arizona State I think it translates well here and I'm going to attach myself for a team that is going to play from ahead and score a lot of points versus these teams that might be throwing quite a bit. Yeah, I mean, 41 catches his last year at Arizona State. He can definitely do that out of the backfield, and we know Brady loves those types of backs. So he's a real interesting one. Uh, definitely more value in PPR. I think Pierce more value in standard, but that's just a situation in Houston where someone's going to come out of that. And is it going to be Marlon Mack? Is it going to be Rex Burkhead? No, I don't trust them. And at the very least, he can be a goal line hammer kind of what you alluded to earlier, what that means in an offense like Houston's, I don't really know, but I kind of like the idea of having one of those backs on my team. So those are uh, some of the running back sleepers we're targeting in drafts or at least taking an extra look at. Now let's go to wide receiver, which is another position that really first year, second year, and third year guys tend to populate the sleeper list at, at wide receiver. So just going into it, Vinny, I know one rookie, and there's a lot of rookies this year, whether it's Olave, whether it's Garrett Wilson, who stand out. But one you're sort of looking at is Traylon Burks. Yeah, I mean, he was drafted directly in relation to the A.J. Brown trade to the Eagles, that they needed someone to replace him immediately. Robert Woods is there, and Bobby Tree still has some value here. But 
I think you started to see him fade a bit. He had the injury issue last year as well. So how effective he can be as he gets older here away from Matthew Stafford and the Sean McVay Rams offense. That's going to be questionable here going forward. But Traylon Burks can do a lot of the things A.J. Brown can do with his body type. There are a lot of vacated targets. In fact, the Titans have the most vacated targets in the NFL from last season. And it didn't quite work out with what they had with A.J. Brown and Julio Jones. But I think Woods is going to be more the complimentary player, and Burks is going to see massive volume. I know that the Titans are not known for being a high-volume passing team, but they can support one wide receiver here. And Woods is going to have some complimentary value, but Traylon Burks, massive upside here with his size and his usage. I think he'll also get to some of that Debo Samuel treatment and get a few touches here as they don't have a lot of experience in the running game behind Derrick Henry. Yeah, that, that's what could make him really interesting. I think he is better value than what Olave or what Drake London or what Wilson are going for. But a couple other rookies that I'm really eyeing, Sky Moore is a big one. You talk about vacated targets. I believe the Chiefs were right behind the Titans in terms of vacated targets, at least among its wide receiver core from the year before. They went up, they got Sky Moore. There's, they just don't have that number one wide receiver, at least a clear cut. Now, Juju Smith-Schuster, I think if he's healthy and everything's good, he'll be that guy. But you bring in the Marquez Valdez scalings of the world and guys like that. I think Skybor could easily uh, stand out among that group, former rapport with Patrick Mahomes. And, you know, you talked in, in our running back piece about you want guys on good teams. I want receivers with good quarterbacks and you're not going to find anyone better than Patrick Mahomes. So I think Moore is really interesting there. And another rookie who I think is being undervalued. People seem to forget he was a first round pick is John Dotson in Washington, who I, is is really weird to me how much people are sort of overlooking him. Yeah, I mean, he's in a pretty good spot. He's going to be the starting outside number two to Terry McLaurin, who's a lot richer than he was last season. And Carson Wentz, he's, I think, the trouble here. We talked about good quarterbacks. I think we think Carson Wentz can be a good quarterback that's going to help our receivers. We hope so. The one thing we're hoping for is that Wentz doesn't just lock into Terry McLaurin. He can do that and get himself in trouble a little bit and not using that type of second receiver but he also has a big arm and I think this uh, commander's team Scott Turner they want to push the ball downfield they just haven't had the guys to do it they've worked in Cam Sims they try to make it work with Curtis Samuel and he's still around and he's probably going to see some slot work but he can't stay healthy so they need someone there to get vertical and that's what Jahan Dotson did at Penn State that's his strength and McLaurin is going to see those double teams and tough coverage here from the number one shutdown type guys so it's going to be available there. Some one-on-one opportunities for Dotson on the outside. So it's all about can Carson Wentz dial up and make that happen. So that's something we're going to watch carefully in the camp, the preseason, how that chemistry develops. Yeah, that one could be real interesting. One more rookie. This is a deeper pull for the 12, 14 team leaders, Jalen Tolbert in Dallas. And this is a situation where you look at what Cedric Wilson did in that third receiver role last year in Dallas, where I think he was like the number 45 PPR receiver. And now, obviously, he's gone. Michael Gallup, he might start the season, uh, not necessarily on pup, but at least inactive for the first couple games. You got C.D. Lamb, you got tight end Dalton Schultz, but there's an opening there. And they just brought in James Robinson. They brought in a couple other, or excuse me, James Washington, and brought in some other young receivers. I think there's an opportunity for a speedster like Tolbert. He's got good size. He's 6'3". He can be used in the red zone. He can be used between the 20s. I don't know. I just think it's more about projection here because this guy wasn't a top-end, you know, uh, blue-chip talent. But they went up and got him in the third round, and I just think given the offense and his tools, this could be one of those guys people are, are really excited about early in the season. Yeah, I think one indication of how they might use Jalen Tolbert, especially with Michael Gallup not available at this moment, is if they work C.D. Lamb in the slot a little bit more. Because that would say that Tolbert has more opportunities when they go three wide receiver and 11 personnel to be out there at least consistently seeing those targets. And with Dalton Schultz, yeah, I think he's an established guy now in that rotation with C.D. Lamb. But that third guy is kind of open at this moment when Gallup is not available. So Tolbert, again, I like the big playability. I like the red zone combination as well. It seems to be that type of body type that does well in the Cowboys offense. So everything lines up here for the opportunity with Amari Cooper gone and vacating some targets there at that third wide receiver spot. So Tolbert is a great opportunity. We're not going to worry about James Washington. He's just a guy here that they added and they were worried about the depth because they lost a couple other guys as well. So I I like Tolbert a lot. I liked him in college as well. 
Yeah, James Washington used to be all over those sleeper lists, but just didn't quite pan out. So looking at some second-year guys we think could break out. One guy I'm looking at, he's further in the rankings again. This is a little of a deeper league pull, but Josh Palmer. Everyone loves Justin Herbert. We love that Chargers offense. We think Herbert's going to be the number two fantasy quarterback. Well, number two fantasy quarterbacks can support three wide receivers, especially when there isn't a dominant tight end. So Keenan Allen and Mike and Mike Williams are good. We all know that, but they both have injury histories. Palmer's got the size. When he started last year, he scored touchdowns every time he started. I really think this could be a breakout guy. It might take a few weeks. He might be one of those guys you have to live through a couple weeks at the bottom of your of your bench. And, you know, you want to make those early roster moves and you're thinking about dropping him after he has a two catch 19 yard first couple weeks. But I don't know. I just think the tools are there. The offense is there. And eventually the opportunities are going to be there. He's my favorite second year guy relative to his value. Yeah, that's a great call, Matt. And just involved in the Chargers offense again, attaching yourself to a high scoring team, a good team with a great quarterback, not a bad idea. Now, Rondell Moore is a guy I'm looking at. We yep. talked about another Moore and Sky Moore and Elijah Moore and more, more, more <laughs> here. Lots but, of more. DJ. Yeah, and we're going to keep you know, finding more sleepers for you. But looking yep. at Rondell Moore, there's reasons why I like him. Here, here's number one is you have DeAndre Hopkins suspended for. Six games. I'm not sure about Hollywood Brown being immediately rekindling that relationship with Kyler Murray. I, I just don't think he's more than a deep threat at this point. I mean, he has kind of set up that talent level in vertically in Baltimore with Lamar Jackson. So they need a guy that can be a jack of all trades, get the ball into the hands of on their short passes. I also like the fact that Chase Edmonds is gone. You don't really have that element to behind James Conner. So in the receiving game, out of the backfield, just get the ball in the hands of Rondell Moore. I think he was criminally underutilized last year by the Cardinals. They could have used him all over the field, especially when Hopkins was hurt. So I think this is a year, maybe in year two, where he kind of puts it all together. And again, this Debo Samuel role has come up, but I think it's a copycat league and you'll see a lot of different players being tried at that. Well, if Rondale's using a Debo role, I don't know how long he's going to be on the field because he's injury prone, but man, he's explosive if you can get him the ball in creative ways. And I think another guy that a lot, this is, this is sort of more of a shallower league. I don't know if you want to call him a sleeper. People are already targeting him, but Rashad Bateman, you mentioned Hollywood Brown. He's gone from Baltimore. Everyone knows Mark Andrews is the number one receiver there, but there is a big void for wide receivers who are going to take over Bateman first round pick last year he's the guy that everyone's pointing to he was injured he was on and off the field last year unfortunately he was decent when he played can he put it together can he break out and maybe even more specific can Lamar Jackson get him the ball enough for him to put up wide receiver three numbers yeah it's very interesting how the Ravens have tried to find the right fit at wide receiver for Lamar Jackson they went out and got Hollywood Brown then they thought Miles Boykin could work and they still have James Prochet and Devin DuVernay hanging around there they just can't seem to find the ideal guy but that ideal guy I think is Rashad Bateman and why is the way he can run routes he's got good size he is very reliable with his hands I think he can do a little bit of everything on the outside I think he's a more complete receiver than Hollywood Brown was for this team and there's only mark andrews there i mean i mentioned duvernay and prochet those are the guys that are next on the depth chart this is a team that's not going to throw a lot we know that we know lamar is going to treat andrews as a go-to guy and that's why he's an elite tight end one but opportunity there for bateman when when he got the opportunities last year started slowly with the health issues and finding his niche in the offense now without brown i think he has a clearly defined role here as the number one so yeah it's not going to be a lot of volume there but it's about getting the key touches and the significant touches. And I think Bateman will get those here behind Andrews. Yeah. One more. This guy was hot on the sleeper list last year, complete bust, at least early in the year, got dropped by week six, week five. Brandon Ayuk, is he officially back to being underrated now, Vinny? Can we call him a sleeper after he was a bust? Well, for high on Trey Lance, a quarterback, and we right. think this team is going to be just as explosive. I mean, He's, there's not much else. The George Kittle and Debo Samuel, I think they're going to be more calculated with their workload because right. both of those guys are injury prone. We know that. And we look at Brandon Ayuk, he can do everything that Debo can do in a little bit smaller package. So that's the bit of a concern that can he hold up with that. But there's nobody else really in this 49ers passing game. They can occasionally use Kyle Juszczyk, but they don't 
throw a lot to their running backs anymore. Elijah Mitchell, that's not a big part of his game. So on the shorter passes, they're going to try to get the ball in the hands of Samuel and Ayuk and Kittle. Short to immediate, they're going to design favorable, comfortable throws here for Trey Lance all over the field. So after the catch, you look at Debo and Ayuk, they can do a lot of the same damage. They're almost interchangeable with the way you can use them on the field. So if he's out of the doghouse and they're committed to using him more and they wouldn't go to many other guys. You got to like Ayuk as a nice sleeper. Well below that you can get him versus Debo Samuel. Right. I think Debo talked about not wanting to run as much this offseason. That was part of the whole trade me or give me a new contract shenanigan. So I think we could see Ayuk run a little bit more. He's very talented. We know that. He's a tough runner. I think it's the pendulum is officially swung and he's underrated. I will say, I, I, you say they don't have much else. I do like Juwan, uh, Juwan Jennings as a very deep sleeper in bigger leagues. But yeah, obviously Ayuk much more uh, on the forefront than him. Okay, now let's get to the biggest afterthought among the big four fantasy positions kicker of course being the actual biggest afterthought but let's get to tight end where it feels like we could almost put anyone after seven on a sleeper list and really anyone on a bus list for that matter but the first guy we're going to talk about is a guy we don't have to do too much research for because we did it all last year Irv Smith Jr. was all over sleeper list going into last year, and then he gets hurt late in the preseason. We had to wipe it all away. He missed the entire season, and Tyler Conklin comes seemingly out of nowhere, has a very solid season for the Vikings at tight end. Vinny, can Irv Smith Jr. basically do what Conklin did and more and break out as a top 10 tight end? Yeah, and you feel more optimistic than we did last year because it's now the Kevin O'Connell offense. It should open up the passing game a little bit more, diversify it, use the tight end effectively, and he's going to find who his best players are. And It's not going to be K.J. Osborne. He's not going to lean there. And we know there's going to be some touchdown regression for Adam Thielen as he gets older here and maybe less effective. He's had more injuries pile up for him. So I just don't see Adam Thielen relying on touchdowns as much. Irv Smith is going to cut into that a little bit, playing off the running game. He's going to be out in the field consistently as a key blocker for Dalvin Cook so he'll be in those scoring situations I think he can stretch the field a little bit down the seam and they're going to try to use him in the best way possible so I do like the upside here if he can be one of the top three targets with Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen I think that comes to fruition and Again, Conklin's production really bodes well here for what Irv Smith can do. Yeah, uh, Conklin was right around top 10 in tight end targets. And you just think if Irv Smith gets those with his ability, I think most of us think, assuming he's fully healthy after the injury, most of us think he has more overall ability than Tyler Conklin. It It could really be a big year for him, and he could be that guy that going into next year we're looking at uh, right around the top five, right, you know, headlining that second tier. And another guy that I think people liked going into last year, he had a decent season, but he didn't score any touchdowns. That's a big, that's a big onion in the ointment when you're talking about fantasy football players, but that's Cole Komet with the Bears. Like I said, decent season, catches, yards, targets, all that was pretty good despite playing for a largely dysfunctional offense. Now they have a new coaching staff. Justin Fields is in his second year. They lost Allen Robinson, which should open up more targets. Can Cole Komet really break out, Vinny? Can he score some touchdowns? Let's just start there. First, Matt, are we sure that Jimmy Graham is far away from the situation? That's what I first. I'm never. About. I'm never sure where Jimmy Graham's going to pop up yeah. and get. Let, let, let's just care. In, in the in the red zone. That- yeah, he was annoying that Jimmy Graham was around, and uh, it was annoying that he was uh, on a couple teams of this division. Cole Kmet, however, can be used a lot like a guy in this division because we have a Packers-style offense arriving in Chicago. That should bode well for his touchdowns because Robert Tunyon, we know, was a big scorer just a couple years ago when healthy in this style of offense for the Packers. And we hear all these things about chemistry between quarterbacks and targets, and there's not a lot here. I mean, we can look at Byron Pringle, but behind Darno Mooney, the guy that there is a comfort level with is Cole Komet because he played with him last year. Justin Fields is familiar with what Komet can do, and it's a Notre Dame tight end, and these guys typically have good careers in the NFL. They're kind of put together their complete game enough to be out on the field consistently, so 
the sky is high for Komet. He's going to find the end zone. He's going to find it pretty early in the season. And he's going to be that reliable security blanket here. You have to look at Justin Fields. It's just completely different. He had a tough rookie season with a bad situation. Now he's in year two with some experience, but in a much better offense. So I do like Cole Komet to get in the end zone. I think he's going to live up to that borderline tight end one ranking. Yeah, it's so tough when you see a really low touchdown total to imagine it going, you know, in Komet's case, zero to seven or at a higher end tight end, Kyle Pitts going from one to ten. But it could. And if that happens, watch out because they're going to fly up the, the tight end rankings by the end of the year. So another guy who had no problem getting red zone targets last year, despite being a second string tight end. And now the starter is gone, at least for now, we think. But I'm talking about Cameron Bray down in Tampa. He was, depending where you look, some some sites have different ways of ranking red zone targets. I would think that would be a pretty standard thing. I've seen him one. I've seen him tied for two among tight ends. Whatever the case, he got a lot of red zone targets, and he was a backup. Rob Gronkowski had 88 overall targets in 12 games last year. He's gone again for now. We'll see if he wants to come out of retirement. But Cameron Bray is the nominal starter now. They have some other guys down there, Kyle Rudolph, rookie Kate Otten. But Vinny, I don't get it. Why is why is Cameron Brait so low? I get he's a boring veteran. I get fantasy owners think they've seen his ceiling, but he's so low in rankings despite having a lot of things pointing in his favor going into this year. Yeah, I think people read into much to Kyle Rudolph joining this team and Otten and Kokeeft was also added on this team. Sure. So there's some tight end options all of a sudden. But keep in mind, they didn't just lose Robert Murkowski. They also lost O.J. Howard. So they had to replenish tight end depth. And they also have to know that Cameron Braid is getting up there. So they needed to get something to look to for the future. So this is the future now when Tom Brady is playing. So right. you got to get the guys he trusts the most. And who does he trust after Mike Evans and Chris Godwin? It has to be Cameron Brait because Russell Gage is new to the team. Julio Jones is new to the team. These younger guys he's not going to involve as much with all these veterans on the team. Certainly uh, not Rudolph, in the red zone, right? No, no. And Rudolph has done some red zone damage in the past, but do we really think at this point Rudolph is a better player and a better target in the red zone than Cameron Brait? I don't think so. So before Gronkowski, let's keep in mind that this development that was there, that these two guys were going to be a connection, a big-time connection, but Gronk came back. Brady got back with his ex. Now he's got to move forward with, with Brait and try to score some points there. So I think, yeah, as you mentioned, the red zone, this is the key to most tight ends, scoring touchdowns, because it's an easy way to get points. It's really hard to accumulate yards and catches to our liking at this position. But if you can get a guy that's going to be involved in the red zone and get at least one look there per game, you're sitting pretty because he's going to come away with a good touchdown total, and that's going to kind of counteract anything he does elsewhere. Yeah, it's pretty much the top five, top six tight ends who are just all around really good players. They put up wide receiver like numbers. The rest, it's almost touched out or bust for almost all of them. There's a few who dealt with Dallas Goddard, Zach Ertz, who are a little more consistent, but Dawson Knox, Hunter Henry, Pat Fryer, these guys, it's all about tight ends. And I think Cameron Brate's definitely going to have those opportunities. So I think he's very undervalued. If you're the type who drafts a backup tight end, he's a guy I would target. Now let's go for a deep pull, Vinny. The people, the 14 teamers, they come here for some deep pulls. Let's give it to them. If you're in an eight team or a 10 team league, you can turn the video off right now. You don't need to hear about Brevin Jordan, but we're going to talk about him down in Houston. Obviously a weird offense. It's tough to feel good about any Houston Texans, but I tell you what, Brevin Jordan going into his second year, you look at what he did last year. He only played nine games, but he had three touchdowns. He got appreciable targets He's very athletic. Can he put it all together, Vinny, and be that dude who at the end of the year we're like, how did Brevin Jordan finish 12th among all tight ends? Yeah, we'd like to write off the Texans as giving up some <laughs> fantasy football help, but we can't. We talk about Damian Pierce. We need right. to extract value from every possible team. And you look at the situation here. Davis Mills is still a young quarterback, and I know he's a big arm, and you still have Brandon Cooks in the mix. And Nico Collins, there's been some buzz about him at wide receiver as well. And they have a little bit more depth there. Unfortunately, the John Mechie situation happened where he's going to have to miss his rookie season entirely now. So they're hurting for guys, for Davis Mills to throw to. And Brevin Jordan, keep in mind, he was right up there with some of the other tight ends that were taken last year to have a lot of buzz at the position. So now you look at Brevin Jordan and what he can do. The targets are available there. If he can 
convince Davis Mills, hey, you got to rely upon me a little bit more. It could be a little bit more conservative approach to the offense, which would also help here. Lovey Smith is now coaching the entire team, so he's probably going to ask for some more boring offense to help his defense. So that actually could play in the hands of Brevin Jordan. So going back to the guys we had, uh, Jeremy Shockey and Jimmy Graham, as we've mentioned before, there's something about those Miami tight ends. It's been a while since we've had that impact, but I think Jordan might be able to give us that. And I thought he was going to go right up there around with Kyle Pitts. They kind of separated there in the draft last year. So he has that kind of athleticism, kind of some wide receiver hybrid skills. And I think you'll see more of that in Houston this season. Yeah, I agree. I just think, you know, if you're really trying to find a diamond in a rough in a deeper league, and again, if you want two tight ends, which I think more people are taking two tight ends now, specifically in response to, kind of some COVID issues where a guy can go on a inactive list the day before a game and you really need to get someone in your lineup fast. So he's the type of guy I would target. You can get him as late as you want him. So it's not, it's, it's such a low risk type pick uh, if you want that second tight end. So there you have it. Those are the tight ends. We've talked about quarterbacks, running backs, wide receivers. We've talked about every position. If you want to go find those videos, get up to date on all the sleepers that we like going into the season. More are going to emerge throughout the preseason. We'll be talking about them on sportynews.com slash fantasy. Everything up to date, all the news you could ever want, all the rankings, all the lists, all the everything to get you ready to dominate your 2022 fantasy draft. So for Vinny Iyer, I'm Malatuski. Thanks for watching.